Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Today, the 14th anniversary of the Affordable Care Act. Stephanie Desmond talks to Javier Becerra, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. They discuss how much has changed in the healthcare landscape since the passage of the ACA in 2010 and why it's so important to protect the gains we've made. Let's listen. Javier Becerra, thanks so much for joining me. It's a real honor to have you on the program. Stephanie, thank you for having me. So today... This month marks the 14th anniversary of the passage of the Affordable Care Act, the signature achievement of the Obama administration. Take us back to 2010. You were a member of Congress when the bill was on the floor. What was the health care landscape like then? Stephanie, back in 2010, there were probably some 50 million Americans who didn't have the peace of mind of knowing they could go to the hospital if their child was Uh, desperately ill, and survive the bill that they'd get for having taken their child to the hospital. That meant that about 16% of Americans didn't have health insurance. Today, less than 8% of Americans are uninsured, so probably somewhere about 25 million, still high, but far less than 50 million. We have seen a marked increase in the number of Americans who have coverage, Today, the Affordable Care Act through the marketplace covers more than 21 million people. The expansion of Medicaid, which is for lower income, has grown some 18 and a half million people because of the Affordable Care Act. And so some 40 million people today count on the Affordable Care Act to have the peace of mind that many of us had before. So what else did we get from the, I think we sort of take it for granted now, right? We have all these wonderful things that came from the Affordable Care Act. What are we seeing today? Yeah, and that's a really important question because it's great to have insurance, but it's what you get when you have the insurance that counts. And in 2010, what we didn't have was the peace of mind knowing that if we needed care, that we would not be discriminated against because of the care we needed. So a woman who happened to be of childbearing age, well, she was discriminated against against in comparison to a man of the same age because as someone who could bear children, she ran the risk of having a bad outcome and therefore perhaps having a need for major surgery, which would cost an insurance company money or possibly dying, which could cost any number of people a lot of money. And so if you happen to have cancer or diabetes, trying to get insured compared to someone who didn't meant that you might have insurance, but you're probably paying way more than they were. Or you might not even get it because an insurance company could deny you care because of a pre-existing condition. And so today, That is no longer the case. The law of the land under the Affordable Care Act is no one can be discriminated against because of a pre-existing condition, whether it's diabetes, whether there's cancer, or certainly if you even classified being a woman as a pre-existing condition, that is now against the law. Today, if you have children who are less than 26 years of age, they can stay on your health insurance policy. Before 2010, they were on their own. And so there are many improvements that were made, including to the Medicare program, which we think of as the program for seniors. Many of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act actually expanded coverage for seniors in Medicare. So preventative health care services, those were now, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, provided to seniors in Medicare free of charge. This this healthcare system has been very successful in many ways. Yet at the same time, it is constantly under attack. We hear, you know, Republican administrations want to roll it back. I'm wondering if it's so great, why do they want to roll it back? That's a great question. I learned today that after the president introduced his budget for the next fiscal year in the last week, I understand that 
Republicans in the House of Representatives have now introduced their budget, and their budget calls once again for the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, which would mean the repeal of health care coverage for some 40 million Americans who have it as a result of the Affordable Care Act. And it certainly means for the 130 some odd million Americans who have a pre existing condition that they would lose the protections against being discriminated against by insurance companies as a result. I'm kind of wondering if there's sort of a danger of feeling like we've, we're taking this for these benefits for granted. For example, you know, we people say that some people argue that they have never seen a case of polio. So why do we need a polio vaccine? And of course, the vaccine is the reason that we don't need we don't have polio anymore. So I guess I'm wondering, is there a danger of us taking this for granted? Yeah, it's such a great example, Stephanie, uh, how once we're inoculated, we, we sort of forget about it, right? We don't worry about it. And now that we've seen, for example, some recent cases of the measles, we had eradicated measles in the U.S. about 20 years ago. And now we're starting to see some cases in Florida, a few other some cases in Illinois, and mostly of people who were not vaccinated. And the same thing applies. People don't think about the fact that today they don't have to worry about being discriminated against because they have cancer. They can still get insurance. They can still get their coverage because today it's against the law for a doctor, a hospital, or an insurance company to say, sorry, not going to cover you because you have a pre-existing condition. Well, if that goes away, millions of Americans are now left on the hook. But here's here's the thing, Stephanie, I don't think it's going to go away because just the way you talk to a senior and ask them if they would give up their Medicare. I remember in 2010 when we were voting on the Affordable Care Act, we had signs of people saying to us because they didn't understand the law. They had heard all this misinformation. They had these signs that said, keep your stinking government hands off of our Medicare. Well, of course, Medicare is a government-run program, and they wanted to, the government to keep its stinking hands off of Medicare. It's just they were confused or they were provided wrong information, and they were going to fight like heck to protect their Medicare. Well, I think today you'll hear the same thing. Keep your stinking hands off of my marketplace or Medicaid expansion coverage. Absolutely. So there's also a big financial piece here, right? There's been a lot of money saved because of the Affordable Care Act. Talk to me about sort of that piece. I mean, I guess it's credited with bending the curve for health care costs. That's right. And it's very simple. As my mom would always tell me when I was growing up, mejor prevenir que remediar. Better to prevent than to remediate. If you're going to pay me now, you're going to pay me later. Better to pay now and take care of it versus pay a whole lot more later on. And that's what we're doing. Preventative care really works. And, you know, Frederick Douglass, a leader of this country from way back in the 1800s, once said, It is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Well, our healthcare system has for too many decades been trying to repair broken men and women rather than build strong children. What the Affordable Care Act did was give us a chance to reach out to more people, a lot of young people, and say, we're going to build you up to be very strong so we don't have to try to repair you later on. And as a result, of course, not only do they benefit with good health and a chance to prosper economically, but so does our economy and our country. So talk to me about the equity piece. It seems as though um, this Obamacare has brought health insurance to a lot of people from a lot of different walks of life. Well, the record number of people who today have insurance through the ACA marketplace is due mostly because people who had previously for long, long stretches of time been uninsured are joining. Uh, Lots of black and brown families are joining. Last year, and we don't quite have the full numbers yet from this year's enrollment, but last year's enrollment to the ACA marketplace showed that about we had about a 50% increase in the number of black Americans who enrolled in marketplace coverage and about a 52% increase in the number of Latinos who enrolled. That's why you're beginning to see these record numbers. We've gone from when this president came to office when there were about 12 million people who had health insurance coverage through the marketplace to now over 21 million people. And you're seeing that increase because it happens to be the best deal in town when you can afford to have health insurance coverage, quality health insurance coverage for $10 or less a month in your premium payments. You can't beat that. You can't go see a movie for $10. Not you know, and forget about the popcorn and the refreshment. And when people see that, they sign up. And so, whether you're rich or poor today, you can afford good healthcare coverage, and that absolutely strikes at the heart of equity. Has anything about the healthcare changes? Has any of it surprised you? Are there things that you sort of didn't even realize would happen? Yeah, I can't believe there's still people in Congress who want to try to repeal a program that has been so successful. 
We'll have to wait till they start to be approached by their constituents and say, keep your stinking hands off of my marketplace coverage. But it's just amazing. It has so worked. It has so protected so many Americans. And the moment people recognize that Obamacare and Medicaid weren't just for the poor, they're the ones that are being protected against discrimination because they happen to have cancer, but they can still access the insurance they need and the doctor hospital they need. They're going to start to say the same thing. Keep your stinking hands off of our marketplace coverage. You know, it's great to see that we've gone from this security that we had from Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, which were programs created 1930s and 1960s, to today, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and Marketplace. So where do we go from here? I mean, obviously, you're pleased with where we've come from. What happens next? Well, you see already from what the president has directed us to do, and he spoke about it in his State of the Union, lower costs, even more. That's why today we're in the midst of negotiating to lower drug costs with the drug manufacturers so we can lower the cost that they're charging Americans, which happen to be two to three times more than they charge people in other parts of the world. So president's goal is to lower costs obviously can continue to increase access to care so everyone has the access to the care that they need. But more importantly is to move us from a system that treats illness to one that sustains wellness. It's the prevention versus remediation. It's where today the Department of Health and Human Services is working with folks who recognize that food is medicine. That's a very three simple words, but more and more people are beginning to realize Food is medicine. If you're going to put something in your mouth, it needn't be a pill that you're popping. It could be fruits and vegetables, berries and nuts. And the more we start thinking that way, the more we'll get our families to be able to feed their kids the nutritious foods that sustain their wellness rather than wait till they're obese, they're sick, and we have to treat their illness. I wanted to ask about drug costs specifically, and I'm wondering what the barriers are right now between having more reasonable drug costs. Well, the lack of real competition. The fact that prior to the Affordable Care Act becoming the law of the land, that we could not, as the federal government, on behalf of the 65 million people who are on Medicare, try to get them the best price by negotiating with drug manufacturers on the price that they would put on their drugs. If you had a chance to go to a car dealership and say, I'd like to buy a new car, that dealer may say, okay, I'll try to negotiate, give you this price. But if you said, a car dealership, I have 65 million people who want to buy a car. What price will you give me so I can give you the business of 65 million people? I guarantee that dealer would say, I'm going to give you the best price in town. That's what the federal government should always be doing to leverage the best price. We were prohibited by law, Stephanie, to do that until the Affordable Care Act passed. And today we're negotiating to lower the prices. I think it's going to show at the end of this negotiation, which will occur later this year, that we can lower drug prices because we don't have to continue to pay such high numbers for big profits for big pharma when people can't afford their medicine, they're they're cutting their pills in half so they can make them stretch, or they're going without paying the electricity bill for a month so they can buy the medicines and hope they can make up paying the rest of the electricity bill later on. That is not the way you need to do that in the richest country in the world. You know, that's what really strikes me is that despite all of these improvements, you're still hearing these stories about people having to do a GoFundMe to pay their medical bills or their insurance denying their life-saving medicine that they've been on for 10 years, say, when will those stories all go away? How do we get there? Oh, we'll keep moving there. When we'll get there, when we'll be in nirvana land, that I can't tell you. But what I can tell you is we're in a far better place today as a result of President Biden, his efforts to increase access and lower costs than we were before. And I hope Americans recognize that it wasn't accidental It wasn't by luck, and it wasn't easy. It was intentional. There was a lot of work that went into this. Just the way the work went into making sure that Americans got protected against COVID, nearly 700 million vaccine shots later, Americans can treat COVID like the flu. That was, again, not accidental. It wasn't luck, 
And it wasn't easy. It was intentional. The president made sure everyone had an opportunity to get vaccinated and they wouldn't have to pay a penny. Stephanie, you and I and everyone in this country has never had to fork over one penny to get vaccinated against COVID. Javier Becerra, thank you again so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Stephanie. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Grace Ciceri. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, Matthew Martin, and Philip Porter, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Ciceri and Eliza Rosen. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.